I have Bibiana Cordero on my show today. She is the co-founder of Vasi Pichanga, an interdisciplinary collective for urban transformations focusing on development of inclusive and child-friendly cities, sharing and developing tools to include kids in decision-making processes. With a thoughtful leadership, she is part of amazing placemaking initiatives like Placemaking Europe and Placemaking X. In this episode, we talked about her passion for creating an impact with the children in the city and how her background in law and urban management helps her in public space advocacy and transformations. Assalamu alaikum and hello everyone. I am Azban Sari, the founder of the organization Peacemakers Pakistani. And I am bringing you the stories of placemakers, artists and professionals from around the globe about how they created an impact and made change happen. You are listening to the Making It Happen show. Thank you for joining in. Enjoy the episode. Thank you for joining me today. How are you and how's it going? Hi, Alva. Thank you for inviting me. I'm super happy to, to be here. I wish this was in Pakistan and that I could travel there. <laughs> but thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. I'm glad to have you. And yes, I'm looking forward towards our session today. And because it has been uh, very I have been looking forward to it because it's with the work we are doing, with the, we share the same vision about empowering the citizens to make change happen for themselves, to create places that are better for them. So I'm very much looking forward to learning from you or how you have been doing and what are your perception and mindset towards it. So let's start with our questions. Um, okay, so tell me what inspired you to be the public space advocate and a place maker? Um, so, I think it's a very interesting story, or I don't know, but oh, I, I, always, I always tell this. Uh, but basically, uh, I studied law in, uh, for my bachelor's, but many of my friends were architects. And uh, I was a little bit disappointed because I didn't like law. I didn't see that, you know, like everything was about justice. It was more about who knows the law better. It was a little bit different or you could not really have an impact on justice for a lot of people, but only in the case you were uh, dealing with. <laughs> so I didn't like it that much at the beginning. And then I went, I traveled with my friends that are architects to Nicaragua for um for a workshop of social architecture, it was called. And it was about intervening public spaces within 10 days. And um, we we basically transformed a plaza. We did a couple of uh, pop-up interventions. And it changed a lot for the people of that neighborhood. A lot of people who didn't have the chance to go outside and play or to even sell things you know, for their own economy. And then I felt like, oh, wow, this is a way to do justice, you know. And so when we came back, we got together um, uh, with different friends from very different disciplines, architects, uh, uh, but also designers, lawyers, doctors even, <laughs> that were very excited about doing something in the city. And uh, that's how we founded uh, Wasipi Changa. And it was basically at the beginning just a group of friends who wanted to do things in the city, to change the public space, to reactivate some of the stuff that were not being done uh, by the local government, and uh, and that inspired me a lot to to yes, like work on the public space, be a placemaker, and after that, yes, I had the chance to work at, in the local government itself and in other projects. So I'm very happy I took that career path. <laughs> Amazing. That's it's a very amazing story and very inspiring one as well. Um, yeah. Um, great. <laughs> okay. So, where did the idea of planning cities with children come from, and how do you do it? How do you get them involved in your process? Um, yes. Yeah, so basically, uh, when we started this this group of friends, <laughs> our uh, this small volunteering group, 
and uh, we did a lot of things in the public space and our first project was to go to a small town near our city in Ecuador and to see what we could transform and actually uh, first we well we realized that maybe they need a market we were thinking about something like that but then we realized that there were so many children around and they didn't have a place to be the playground of their school was destroyed so we decided to work with that and it was very easy to work with children in the sense that uh, normally when you go to a neighborhood and you want to do something adults will doubt you or with and and i mean they have fair reason to question what's going to happen what are you going to do but sometimes they think it can be political or sometimes they have very high expectations so it becomes very difficult to talk with them about the very simple things of why to intervene in a public space while children understand it very easily and they understand the simple things of what do you want to do because at the beginning also we were doing very very yeah very simple stuff like we we build a playground with with different materials that the community had and then we intervened several plazas uh, in our city but children were very convinced about why we were doing it like oh is it to be together and it looks nicer and oh we need light and we need this and we need that so the way now or the way that we found was best to intervene the city was with children not only for children but we realized that children are very good messengers of the project if they understand the message if they know why is it important for everybody else then they go to their families and they say, well, grandpa, they are doing this, come with me, or this is important, or I don't know, my uncle likes to play football, so we also should do like a football court. You know, they are advocating for all their family, not only for themselves. So we found out that including children, every time that we do a process is way better for, for everybody. And uh, it's easier. To, to translate the message on the objectives and the ideals of your project. Uh, and uh, children are also very vulnerable in what they want and what they need. They, they are more expressive about their needs. Yeah, whereas the youth and the adults are more like they prefer what their mind says instead of what their heart says. So it becomes easier in that way as well. Okay, so how do you define the term child-friendly cities? Um, uh, well, I think it's um, the compilation of things. Um, for on one side is making sure that, especially you're giving a different, or you are making sure that the needs of the children are covered. So simple things as I don't know if you've heard about the Bernard van Leer Foundation program, Urban 95. They dedicate this program specifically to very small children from zero to three. And one of the things they do is that they take you outside to explore the city from a 95 centimeters perspective. <laughs> so if you start walking like down and look from that height, you realize how, how much in danger you feel. You realize how much cars can really uh, abruptly, you know, scare you while you're in the in, in the public space and things like this. So I think one one main um, feature of being child friendly is to be able to provide the space to children for them to feel safe, for them to um, feel that they they are part of the space and that they, they can um, independently move in the space. That's very important. But another part of being child-friendly is about the governance, right? How much children participate, how much the government cares about their human rights, uh, making sure that they have access to school, access to play, access to water, access to different services. And I think something that it's uh, maybe a little bit new <laughs> for child-friendliness, but I, I would like to argue that it's very important is the intergenerational justice. We talk a lot about sustainability, sustainable cities, 
making sure that we use the resources now without jeopardizing the resources of the future generations. And we have these city visions for 2050, 2070, about how our cities are gonna be, but we don't ask the children anything about it. So if we give them a little bit more agency and if we think about these city visions thinking, okay, the children now are the biggest agents, agents of what's gonna happen in the future, we need to include them. So I think these three things are, are mainly what would do a child-friendly city, like uh, giving the proper space, giving the proper services to make sure that their rights are covered and thinking about the sustainable future with them. Right, uh, you are a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> You put it well, you put it together so well. I really appreciate that because, yeah, you you know, these these topics are needed to be highlighted and to be paid attention towards. And yes, you said it very well. Okay, so <laughs> I have read about you on your profile that you focus on two main things, um, placemaking and participatory strategies and the collaborative planning, especially the inclusion of academia and social innovators as main stakeholders. So I want to ask you that, why do you focus on these two? Well, uh, may I focus on place making mainly because I think it's a um, really smart investment that brings things on the short term, that allows you to iterate your concepts, you know, like sometimes architects or urban planners or cities can have this idea of this is the best area ever we are going to invest in millions <laughs> and then when you evaluate you are already screwed <laughs> sorry to use these words but it's like oh okay now what do we do nothing like it's lost so nobody comes or whatever if it goes wrong of course sometimes it goes well it's true but if it goes wrong there's little chance to correct what happened but placemaking allows you to do to do things bit by bit evaluate it come back say like be confident of making some mistakes you know like oh, okay this didn't work here but it was not this big investment we can change it we can reevaluate it the community is giving you constant feedback loops <laughs> that you can take to your work and improve it and then make it permanent like I think that it's important to know that placemaking has a long-term vision of making places uh, really livable, you know, but you can do it in, in steps. And I think that's why I am very attracted to using placemaking place as a strategy for city development. And uh, the collaborative planning, it's something that I was very interested in because in Ecuador, universities have a very big say on what's happening in our cities. If the universities say that this mode of transportation is right, then people think it's right versus a politician that could say, I want to do this and everybody's questioning it, which is okay. I think people should question <laughs> everything, but in a way, at a certain point, I felt that people stopped questioning academia. Like we take for granted that science is correct, <laughs> but science is all about testing it. You know, you develop a theory in science and a theory means that anybody could tell you, no, that theory is not right anymore, <laughs> you know? And uh, so I felt at least in my city that academia had this very big say on, on planning and nobody was questioning it. So I wanted to know if the government and the academia were actually collaborating or if people wanted to first be a part of the academia so then they are less questioned when they become politicians. <laughs> I wanted to understand a little bit those dynamics because I think all the knowledge in the city is important from the academia to the government to the private sector and to the children even, like they have a lot to teach us about how cities should be. So I'm very interested on in how to make this collaborative process feasible without making the plans um, of less quality. Like sometimes what's the problem in collaboration is that because everybody wants to agree on something, we give up 
on many things that could make plants of yeah of better quality so so yes uh, this is something that i couldn't have an answer on how to do it or anything or if it's the best way to plant cities but i think it's always nice to look at collaboration and what can we learn from every citizen yes uh, it, it is very interesting to know that your um, universities have a very your universities have a saying that uh, i think we should learn this from you people that universities should have this um this opportunity and this position to say things and because it will empower students as well and it will bring more attention towards what is needed in for the practical life as and uh, instead of what is in the books already yes um interesting okay um who are the stakeholders that you target most and why um i think it depends for every project but i do try to bring children to the table on every project yeah as i said before it's mainly um it's mainly this idea that children would always have a say with less interests um so so it's easier to to imagine and plan for the future with different scenarios when you bring children to the table so i think it depends uh, at every project with you who you should bring to the table as a stakeholder but we always try to advocate uh, for children to be there right um and how do you uh, where do you find this you know i mean do you go to schools or you start from the societies what is um but well, when we were in ecuador we did uh, we did started like in the public space whoever the children that were around and brought more children to the neighborhood um but i think uh, in other projects it was more through the government through ngos the, at the every time that the projects grew bigger i think it was a little bit more formal the way you involve children and i think in any case uh, it is important that you care about child safeguarding how do you make sure that they are safe uh, because i was always a bit uh, scared and even surprised that in some places you know you you go there you are these young people that want to play with the children and then parents send the children with you you know for the whole day <laughs> so like yeah yeah go at least it ha- maybe in the netherlands it doesn't happen i haven't tried but in ecuador it's like that people trust you you know it's like yeah yeah go play and then bring me the kid by 6 but i think that we need to be responsible professionals to say okay uh, parents this is what we're going to do this, this is my id children are going to be with us that we are always uh, responsible of several children and that we know how to how to handle that and it's always easier if you approach this through a schools or through an ngo or through people that have more expertise on that but it doesn't mean that you really can't approach children is just to make sure that you put yourself on protocol yeah taking responsibility of children is uh, something i really try not to do right now <laughs> because it it's a very huge responsibility you know at times it depending on the place we are in okay so explain the terms to me bottom up and top down approaches yeah so well there is this um this views right that you can plan from the government and say this is what we're going to do and then you regulate like that and then there is this bottom up more organic thing that people is doing things like things are happening anyways and then people um does it enough to bring it to the agenda you know and uh, and they do things themselves they're taking the responsibility of planning the city themselves to me i feel there is a need of mixing it uh i don't think that governments can put all the responsibility on citizens to to change <laughs> their their reality or their places because probably that's the way we I mean that's why we chose to have governments in the first place right <laughs> to delegate some of the responsibilities um 
but also top down makes it very makes it yeah very restricted i think and sometimes it's easier to make mistakes because then you don't know how people are actually going to use the space or act or so i think that it's very important that when we think about planning or city development it has to be a mixture a mixture of both things because also bottom up things organic things are always going to happen whether you plan it or not unless you are very very restricted as a government so um yeah that's what that's my opinion that it should be in the middle how can we collaborate and, and work towards a better city together yes i agree okay um how do you bring different age groups together and work out a single place that serves all do you bring them together at same time on a table or do you have separate meetings and then a combined vision um a little bit of both um I think, as I as I told you at the beginning, when we work with children, we bring children first because we want them to be able to explain our project to the adults. If they can, then it means everybody can understand. <laughs> and uh, in that way, we make sure that happens. And once they have a clear picture of it, we also have a clear picture of what type of adults we are going to encounter in the sense that they will tell us how their parents think, if they have, I don't know, as I told you before, like an uncle that loves to do something specific on the, on the city or um, maybe a sibling with some sort of disability or, you know, a very old grandparent. So by asking the children about who they, are, they care in their families, then you have a very big idea of how the community is. And, uh, and then we bring adults to the table and if there is a need to put them together, we do. And if there's a need to talk to specific people, we also do. But I would say that it is a pattern for us or a methodology to always talk to the children and only the children first. Okay, makes sense. Um, okay, um, what was the intent behind Real Play City Challenge? Also, oh, the uh, the Real Play City Challenge is a project um, launched by the Real Play Coalition and Plays Making X. And uh, it's very nice that we've come together because, well, the Real Play Coalition um, are, it's, it's formed by Lego, IKEA, UNICEF, uh, Arup, and National Geographic. And Plays Making X, although some of us are working directly in the project, um, Place Making X, it's a very big network of more than in more than 70 countries that is people like you and me trying to do something there, right? And to improve uh, the quality of spaces. And basically, the main idea is to reclaim spaces to play. Uh, I think that there is this big um, yeah, data and evidence that play brings a lot to the city. If children are able to play, they grow up way better. They, um, they can develop all types of skills for the future, creative skills, social skills, um, cognitive skills. And it also makes the cities and the communities more resilient. Because if you bring a community together and they know each other in the space, if something happens, it's easier for them to have a network of contact to react to crisis. So play not only for, for children as, um, as their development, but what that means to the wider environment, what that means to their parents, which uh, you know have less stress if children have the opportunity to play. I think um, it's, it's very important for the cities. So this is what brought us together. And what we want is to find placemakers, find cities who also join this, uh, this concept, you know, that are also aware of the importance of play. And we want to, at, at the beginning, the concept was to maybe do something outside, but then because of the COVID, well, we had to kind of restructure the event itself for this edition. And so we 
move it to something where we could celebrate initiatives that have already had impact on the ground, but also share knowledge. But we really hope this goes uh, on in the future and that we can really go to a city and develop a child-friendly neighborhood together, for example. And mainly that bring opportunities to play for children because it is really um, now more than ever evidence that they need time and opportunity to play, to develop. And uh, I think it's completely, completely different, you know, if you're a parent and your child can work, can, you know, can be playing outside and you can work inside and, and be fine with it, then thinking, okay, my city only has one big park half an hour away, then I really need to wait for the weekend to bring my children there so the children are bored the rest of the week, they don't know what to do, they don't learn. So I think that's that's very important that we portray our cities in these opportunities of play beyond the playground. Um, I also learned a lot about my own city while finding the answer to this challenge. While uh, like how do how can I participate? I was really shocked that <laughs> we don't have such places um, now. We used to have it before when we were children. We had safe places but now we prefer not going outside without the guardians and uh, so yeah it was a good um sort of eye-opening experience and looking forward to making things better for ourselves here in pakistan so i really appreciate that <laughs> okay um uh, while working with children and four children what are your major findings till now the things that you learned or discovered through the process and you were unaware about it before, and now you are having it as a guiding star. So share something like that. Yes, well, I think the, one of the biggest lessons I got from children is about, is that the problem is not always where you think it is, somehow. Um, I think that, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, no, I just, uh, it showed that my connection was not so I thought I was out. <laughs> yeah. No, but, um, yeah, I was saying that, um, that sometimes the problem is not where we think it is. Um, I've had a couple of experiences where I ask children, where we go and ask children, what do you think about this playground? Do you think that fence, like, do you, I don't know, do you like that fence? Do you uh, use that slide? Things like this. And they are like, no, oh, the playground is awesome. What the problem is that my mom doesn't let me go to the playground or that my mom doesn't let me climb the fence <laughs> or that my dad doesn't have the time to go, to go out with me. So I think that uh, for us as planners, uh, it's, it's important that maybe we can learn from children that we have to think beyond the design and beyond the space to the more cultural approach as well. And to really try to either work in a multidisciplinary way with people that can help you out understanding the communities better uh, or really put yourself into that role of a facilitator and a mediator and understanding them first, because maybe the problem is not on the space, you know, maybe you want them to use it in a, a really nice space, you design something amazing, but the problem is not there. Um, that's something we've also learned, for instance, now that we, with Wasipichanga, we're doing a pilot project in Ecuador to make the surroundings of schools more walkable, and um, safe for children. And for instance, even if we make the surroundings of the school beautiful and amazing, we are sure that most of the children won't walk to school because our national education system doesn't force you to go to the school that is near your home. You can choose which school to go. So a lot of children live very far from the school that they go to, and it's difficult for them to say, yes, I'm going to walk or I'm going to bike. But then when you talk to them, you can understand that, okay, maybe all the parents 
want to drop them at the door of the school. <laughs> but if we could at least divert the traffic into four or six points and make hop on, hop off places, then we could change already a big part of the city. And these are the things that we are trying to do. Like first really do an assessment of what the problem could be with the children who know best about the, the places that they go to and what they do, and then try to bring up some more, um, I mean, some ideas that come more from our disciplines. That was a very good lesson. Yeah, I learned from you now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so I saw you shared a post that claims early my early childhood matters, and you also support the initiative setting place for the improvement of health and well-being of babies, toddlers, and people who care for them. So tell me about your how do you perceive it? And because in Pakistan we see these people, we we see that these people are safe only within the homes. We don't see them outside. So how do you see that? How do you perceive it? I think it's crucial and um, I really encourage everybody to go and check the projects that the Bernard Fowler Foundation is doing. And they do a lot on early childhood and they focus a lot on zero to three. And I think for us as planners is very important. And um, two of the things that blow my mind when I look at that is that, for instance, if government invests seven dollars in a child from zero to three you get back from 16 to 19 in the future in your national economy which is mind-blowing compared to what you can do with those seven dollars after they are three or now in the adulthood if i give you seven dollars now it's not going to be the same as an investment on a on a baby basically and another thing is that it's really important is the impact that our decisions on planning have on the children and then on their parents. For example, if tomorrow we follow a mom or a family, you know, that has three children, their life is completely different in the city than if we follow a 20-year-old university student. If you're a student, let's say you live with your parents, then you go to the university, you all go out with your friends, then you go home. Let's say you live alone, you go to the university, then maybe you go out with your friends, then you go to the supermarket, then you go home. And that's your mobility chain. But if you have children, you have to wake up, you have to take one to the kindergarten, the other one to a school, then you have to go to work. Then you go out of work, pick them up. You have to take one to, I don't know, math lessons, <laughs> the other one to the grandparents because you have to go back to work. <laughs> and then you have to go back to the grandparents, then go to the supermarket, then hopefully go to a playground if you have time and then go back home. And this mobility chain completely changes everybody's life in the city as well because it means that we have other needs. Unfortunately, who is planning for these mobility chains are not mothers or maybe fathers, yes, but not the people who are taking care of children every day. And these things are not taken into account. So I think that's why it's important to think that early childhood matters, not in a way that all oh, poor babies or beautiful babies, we are going to care about them, but in a way that if we don't care about them, we are destroying our own daily lives because our lives are being more difficult <laughs> because we're not taking into account what makes a, a difference in our own decisions. You know, like I, I always tell this story about, um, there was a, a study in Poland where they ask people working at the municipality about, like who takes decisions about very uh, simple things like for instance what are we going to have for dinner or uh, do you want to buy i don't know like um, a dessert what would that be or are we going on holidays where are we going <laughs> and most of these decisions parents say or these uh, workers say that depend a lot if they were parents on their children 90% of the decision was made by the children or but why what the children need and then they make questions about the city in regards to that. And not even 2% of the decisions were made with or by the children. So it makes a whole difference in our own lives. It's just that we 
don't stop to think what impact it has on ourselves. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I think we need to leave out that culture of only like, oh, we need to take care of children, but how taking care of children is beneficial for us at the same time. Um, so I have come to know that you had some collaboration with Pakistan's forum. What was it about and how was your experience? Oh, yes, it was uh, a few months ago. It was a um, yeah, short interview as well. And uh, it was also about child-friendly cities. Probably I told a lot of these same stories. But I'm very happy because I have a few friends uh, from Pakistan. I did my master's here in the Netherlands. And I have uh, friends that are now um, professors <laughs> or teachers in the university there. And I think that they also have this willingness to change things, to bring new things to the system. And uh, I think it's good for all of us, you know, that now we have this chance to have collaboration, uh, even if we are very far. And something that was very nice about that, I think, was that we were able to, to share stories from a very similar context. Uh, sometimes it's difficult when you want to tell in your cities or in your municipality, let's do this or let's invest in children or let's, um, I don't know, uh, put more bikes. And they're like, no, that's a European thing, you know, here is not possible. <laughs> and we look up to Europe, we look up to the United States, which is not a place to look up <laughs> in urban planning, I would say personally. <laughs> but we don't look at ourselves like our global south which has the same challenges the same opportunities but also amazing ideas amazing people working on this daily and of course it's way easier for each other to to understand from the lessons in our projects than to understand from lessons of projects that were done in amsterdam or berlin you know so that was very nice i think that this is what what we should reinforce and strengthen, like this collaboration between countries that normally have the same challenges and that are growing also faster than probably these developed countries. Right, so what was the main thing that you concluded from that conversation? As in, what was the main focus or the main challenge we are facing today, globally? Well, I think the main challenge is um, how fast the cities are growing versus how fast can we act, <laughs> I would say. And, uh, but there are solutions, right? Like one, looking at each other's project, how can we collaborate? How can we use low resources to make high impact? Because it's also about how can we use the resources? And, and then something that came also to the table was the role of academia right like if we can really take advantage of having so many students wanting to do something then let's give them a role in the in the cities and let's try to work with them towards new things that could change our systems to make them more adaptable to what we're living right now and um, so i think those were the main the main insights and the main lessons of, of that Great. conversation all right thank you so much for your part for playing your part in that okay um tell me about the project that you are most proud of and how inspired the city council to modify its law in order to support artists and events in public space i mean that's a great accomplishment how did it happen mm. yes this is a, a very nice project we did in, in cuenca in ecuador basically we came to know that a lot of artists were having difficult times to perform in the street. And uh, the city council wanted to ban the, the, yeah, the musicians, the artists to be outside. But we also thought that, okay, we want more lively public spaces. We want public, I mean, if you are in a public space where there's a lot of people, then you feel safer than there is a space where nobody is there. And uh, normally buskers and, musicians, they attract people. So how can we do something to prove that this is important? And what we did is that there is like this big uh, staircase from the 
new part of the city to the old part of the city that is super big, but everybody uses just this transit. And at a certain point, 6 p.m., people already don't cross because nobody is there and so on. And what we did is basically we sat there. We took, um, I think I have a picture I could I could share <laughs> because it's, it's very simple, but <laughs> let me share very fast. Oh no. Maybe I have it. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it. So this is the staircase. Yeah. And basically here, like it's like a whole platform that you could use. Right. So what we did is just we took the <laughs> the sofa from our house. <laughs> in one friend's car and we sat there as if it was our living room <laughs> and people just came and talked to us right like what are you doing here it's like no we want to use the public space and then we got musicians that were that started to use the public space like with us every thursday and then we got like poets that wanted to do poetry there and of course we gather people we gather people and then at 6 p.m that was full <laughs> instead of being like the place where nobody wanted to go it was full of people <laughs> so then next to it there's a museum but they used to close at 6 p.m so then they said okay guys we're going to help you and we're going to give you the speakers we're going to give you all the equipment from the museum after we close and you bring it back tomorrow <laughs> So they were really nice. They trusted us after, I don't know, five weeks or something. And then we started to do concerts with their help. And then it was like this. So it became very, very lively. We were super happy. We had people, professional dancers, professional uh, groups of music applying to be there on Thursday. So it became a festival. And what we did is that we took advantage of this momentum and we started to survey the people that was there. And with that data collected, we send it to the city councillors, and then we invite them also like to see it. So they were there. And this was the day that the law was approved at the city council <laughs> that instead of restricting the space, you could ask the municipality for money or for equipment to use the public space. So I think I'm very, very proud of that project because it was also an organic collaboration. It started with a couple of people, but then everybody joined. Then we made sure, yes, to gather the data and go to the city council and say, hey, look. But I think it felt like an accomplishment of all the artists of the city, you know? So it was a project that we are personally like very, very proud of. Wow, this is awesome. Um, you basically inspired people by doing an act and they just followed and performed themselves and and it worked awesome okay so now this will set the ground for the next question how, how does being a lawyer helps you in better advocating for public spaces you say that you have found better alternatives in urban studies to achieve social justice so what are those and can you share them somehow yeah well i think um being a lawyer has helped me understand the regulations better for instance, when you can find gaps in the regulations to use that to transform the city, that's one thing. But also um, trying to not only like explain your needs to the municipality or to the government for them to do the law, but kind of making sure that the law that they do will uh, meet your expectations. But at the same time, I don't think you need to be a lawyer or you need to be an architect to transform things tomorrow. It has been way easier for us to have a multidisciplinary team where everybody has studied different things. So they bring a lot of knowledge to the table. But I think one of the reasons why I really like working with children is because I want people in power to understand and see that not only other people in power can tell them what to do, you know, or not only big, um, I don't know, associations of students can have an impact because even if you don't think so, like this, these bodies uh, or institutions have an have a very a better, I don't know, um, entrance to to make decisions, right? So I think. 
uh, beyond that, I think it's very important that we know the activities and daily actions that anyways transform the city. So it's better to look at it from all the lenses instead of only looking at it from the urban planning lens or architecture or lawyer. Even if you're the best in the world, <laughs> it won't be enough to plan a city, I would say. Right. Okay, how do you advocate for and support this statement, children rights to play? How do you define the vitality of play? Uh, let this conversation be the inspiration for people to advocate for play. <laughs> so I think maybe it's important to know that play is an expectation, right? You play when you uh, just kick a can on the street <laughs> or a stone or something. And you also play when you sit with everybody and you're like, okay, now it's time for Ludo or Risk and you plan all this strategy. <laughs> and both children and adults like to play and everybody gets a learning experience from play. So how can we bring that play into our everyday lives is by making our spaces feasible for that. So um, I just think that we have to think beyond what's formally right <laughs> in a way, but go back to the children that we were, you know, like say, well, think about maybe the city that you live in and it's like, what, what place do you like to go to and why? Sometimes you don't like to go to a playground or you don't like to go to a park, but you like, I don't know, like a coffee place in which you can see the water or you can see others play chess or, or I don't know, or you like a specific pattern of the floor that you can jump or that it just calls your attention. So I think it just uh, means that if we try to bring play everywhere in the city, we are looking for a way to make our lives less stressed. Uh, if we are only planning the city from a, from a point of view that I need to get fast to work and back, <laughs> which is, I think, what we've been doing so, so far, I need to be productive and do this and that. Um, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> we've seen that also with the pandemic that can just end, you know? And I think we humans need entertainment. <laughs> and uh, one thing that I was always like very interested about when, when we talk about play is that evolutionary scientific, <laughs> I don't know, this is from a documentary, but it stayed on my mind. <laughs> For them, it's still a question why humans play, you know, <laughs> like all, all animals, <laughs> all animals actually play, but all animals in evolution try to do their best to be productive, to, to uh, maintain their energy, to find food, to keep that energy. And then play is something that we do and we lose all our energy and it doesn't have an objective. <laughs> so why do we do this as a species that, that normally for evolution would do something completely different, right? Why do we put all this energy on play? So I think what they say, for instance, is that it's because you learn, it's because it gives you the opportunity to experiment other things. It's because it gives you the opportunity to be away of that stress of, I need to be productive, I need to live like this, I need to do that. And it gives you a time to, to breathe, to be in community, to enjoy life. So it's just, to me, it's just like, like, like that, not thinking about play only for children, thinking about the play, how play can bring benefit for everybody and how can we just include play in our lives in a way that it makes sense, you know, we, not, we don't need to only be productive. All of us enjoy these moments of playing and things like that. And so we should give ourselves the chance to have that in our cities as well. Yes, and I guess our, this next question can conclude this whole conversation. Okay, so Hans Rosenbeck says that a child-friendly city is good for health and well-being, local economy, safety, stronger communities, nature and sustainability. Resilience and also acts as a catalyst for improving cities. How do you support this statement? Because children have never been a priority in urban planning and management. So how did you people in Europe came to this conclusion? Because it's a very 
it is very important vital need uh, the vital for this whole scenario and place making right yes um i i think that Hans, well, he has done a very great job on uh, thinking about um, cities at the human scale. And they started this project about the city at eye level. And it also evolved into the city at eye level for kids in which I had the, the chance to work up. And it's amazing because you see the city not from the typical, um, I don't know, like from the top in which everything is planned and nice, but you put yourself down and you think like, okay, now I'm here. This is what I'm feeling. How do I see and perceive the city now? Same uh, for children, right? And I think that, that that position of yourself, whether it is as a professional in planning or as a citizen, a citizen in general, it makes you think, about the city from perception and from feelings. And it makes it makes it a very more, I don't know, uh, a more human approach, I would say. You know, not only from the logic and the space should be like that, but this is how I actually feel on the ground. And he always says that maybe, um, you know, the, the, the I think I have this phrase here and I wanna, I want to show it because it's it's very interesting. I like it. <laughs> ah, let me see one second. Here, I'm gonna I'm gonna share with you because I think it's it's really worth noting. Yeah. Yeah. He also says that the ground floor may be only the ten percent of the building, <laughs> but it determines the ninety percent of the street. And oh, yeah. I think it's really important to, to note because then what makes that experience is what makes you feel healthy, what makes you feel safe, what makes you feel resilient, what makes you feel that you live in a community. And so from there, it comes a lot of that, of that knowledge, right? It's, uh, it's about that perception. It's about looking at the data, not only from the objective part, of, okay, this street was one meter and now it should be two meters for another car or it should be half a meter so that we make it more walkable. <laughs> it's more about whatever you are. Are you feeling safe? Are you feeling uh, playful? Are you feeling stressed or not and why? And then you can determine the experience of the city. And, and I think this is uh, like a really, a really good way to shape our, our spaces when we think from that perspective. All right. Yes. Okay. So why should people read the book The City at High Level for Kids? How is it helpful? Any comments on that? You have been a part of it, right? Yes. Oh, I would really recommend everybody to have a look at it. First of all, because it is a book written by more than a hundred authors from all around the world. It was an open call as well that um, asked people who had uh, good, good practices and good examples of places um, that are good for kids. So it gives you a good overview of what can you do in your country, what can you do in different scales from the micro scale of your doorstep to the more macro scale of a citywide strategy. So I think it's a very good source of inspiration. but. Um, they also did a great job uh, looking at the at the indicators that you have to look at when when you want to transform a street or when you want to assess a place. So it could vary in different contexts, but I think it's very holistic in what they show, and uh, it's a very good tool. We also have a manual in the uh, a manual of the city of Ireland for kids and. There you can have like more graphs and a little bit of exercises in, that you can use to apply that, that shared knowledge. And it's open source, so you can download it. And, uh, and yes, and from there you can use all these indicators or these elements and features to assess the place and to think about it from a more child-friendly perspective. Yes, I have gone through it once and I was 
I was fascinated by the book and I was very much moved yet. I want to do these things. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to the wrap up questions. Um, what drives you? What keeps you focused on the public spaces, Rihanna? Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard work, like everything, you know, like sometimes things don't go right, sometimes things go really well. And so I think that there are two things that drive me. One that drives me all the time and another one that is more particular for this time. <laughs> so the first one is the concept of Wasipichanga. Uh, Wasipichanga for us in Ecuador it is the, the moment in which the communities, the indigenous communities, finish building a house. And normally, well, they say uh, one man cannot build 10 houses, but 10 men can, you know? So in this, in this way, it just says that, well, you can really uh, get together and make the things that are great for your community. And so what they do is, for instance, if you want a house, then we all get together, we build your house, then you all help me build my house and so on. And the Wasipichanga itself, the word, is the day in which the house is finished and you get together to celebrate it. <laughs> and it just brings together, I think it, it shows the importance of celebrating the things that you create and celebrating the things that you create in community. And I have to say that my, my team at Wasipichanga is, is great. <laughs> I, we, we really like it. We welcome people to different projects. So you're also welcome and invited to, to work with us if you have any idea. <laughs> and I think that team also always keeps me motivated to, to work because I know that we're passionate about it. Uh, but the other thing that motivates me, and I've noticed now in the pandemic <laughs> that we cannot even go out to the public space, <laughs> is what legacy you can leave, even if it's from a very, very small action. So before I used to live in, um, in a house that had like three floors. So I lived in the second floor in, a, in an apartment. And in three years, I never met my neighbors. Never, I never met anybody. Like you just don't see them around or you don't see people twice or you don't notice. <laughs> and I recently moved and I moved to a place that it's like on the ground floor, like right at the corner in a very busy street. It used to be a restaurant, a store or something and they transformed it into an apartment. <laughs> and so kind of everybody can look into my house and I can see out as well. <laughs> And it has just like a little, a little sticker so that they don't see everything. But you, if you go like this, you can see what people is doing in my house. And it's funny because children that go out for a walk and things like that, they can see inside my house all the time. And they are always looking at what's happening. <laughs> so I say hi and I... I leave a little drawing for them every day <laughs> or I don't know, a puppet or something. And now we are friends, you know, <laughs> and now their parents have knocked my door a couple of times and they're like, oh, I see that you always interact with my children. So now I want to talk to you and things like that. <laughs> and suddenly I know the whole neighborhood and I don't live even three months here. And it motivated me a lot because Yes, I did that because children are funny and so on, but it was also a way of understanding what are they seeing when they go around, you know? And, uh, and I don't know, it just brought me a lot of motivation because it clearly, like now I know that if I'm alone in my house and something happens, I know all my neighbors, I can call them tomorrow. And it brings this feeling of resilience, you know, like the neighbor who knows each other, we are a community and it's just a big change. So that's something that really motivated me to say like, okay, yes, we really need to work on the public space, but not only on that, but on all the things that can, all the little things that can bring neighbors together. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, impressive. Okay, so share your proudest moment of your work life. My proudest moments of my work life. <laughs> um, well, it's 
difficult, but uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think the, the story I told about bringing that to the municipality, it was very nice. Another thing I'm very proud of is to have been part of the Real Play City Challenge. I think it's a very uh, good platform, a global platform that brings so many people together, hopefully. And, uh, but yeah, I think mainly what makes me proud are, to be honest, the things that, that we do as Wasipichanga that are not that mainstream. <laughs> like we we build a little a little garden this year uh, outside our friend's um, house, and uh, we build it like it's a it's a whole neighbor yeah like two blocks of the same types of buildings, and so we build a little garden outside their building, and then the neighbor said like oh why are you doing this can you do it for us as well and they're like no we just started it and we want to have it like that. And after two months, they all have built these gardens outside the, their buildings. And I think these are not like the big projects that you can show online or whatever, but these are the things that really bring change. And that's what really makes me proud. That's why I'm always motivated when I work with my team, because these small things that anybody can do and that anybody can do tomorrow are the really inspirational things that will bring change. That's at least what I think, like not expecting the government or big companies or big people to initiate something, but what can you do yourself tomorrow in your street <laughs> to make it different? Yes, the impact basically drives you. Yeah. Okay, so what was your struggling moment of work life? Was there any? Yes, I think um, after I, I graduated from my master's, it was a little bit hard to see the, the urban planning market. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's, of course, still very restricted to, to certain professions, to certain disciplines. And um, also, I would say, it's not as globalized as we would like to, you know? Uh, if I wanted a job in the Netherlands, well, first, of course, I have to speak Dutch, and then it would be very hard for me to get a job in the municipality non, not being Dutch. It's not impossible, of course, but it's, it's harder. Um, so I think it was a little bit of, yeah, of a struggle to think, how can I really be part of this discipline? And it took me some time to understand, like, okay, I did this in Ecuador with Wasipichanga. I started myself. I did small things because I was passionate about these things. Why don't I do the same here in the Netherlands? And, and we started like that, you know, we started doing things ourselves. Then uh, we partner with Stipo uh, to do this city at a level for, for kids um, things. Then we decided to turn it into a manual. Then we became leaders of Placemaking Europe and we are doing other projects with Placemaking Europe. We're doing a research project. We are doing, um, we did a, a, a translation of a book that was made by a Mexican collective for children in quarantine to explore the places inside their houses from, from a perspective of play, from a perspective of making sure that you feel safe. What is your safe space inside? And, um, and so with Placemaking Europe, we also try to, to translate this to many different languages, and it was great. And then uh, with Pichanga, now we have very different projects. Uh, the Real Place City Challenge is one, but we also have projects in Ecuador. We've been to China, we've been to Armenia, we went to Senegal uh, to develop a course for all the mayors of Senegal. So things have been great and i think it's because we just tried it's not always easy <laughs> but i think that passion drives more than fear you know <laughs> so yeah. if i would have a fearing that i'm never gonna get a job probably i wouldn't have gotten a job <laughs> so i started to do the things that i'm passionate about try to talk to people with the same passions and say, okay, what's next? What can we do? What can we do without money, <laughs> you know? And then I think from that, 
you build what you want to do in your in your career and um, that's why i wish that a lot of students in university will have the chance to be more hands-on on place making on tactical urbanism on just going out and see what happens if you i don't know move a bench from one place to the other and see if that brings some inspiration you know to what they want to do because I don't think we'll ever find exactly the moment in which you don't struggle anymore. Uh, yeah. With place making, you're never done. <laughs> so, so you always keep iterating, keep trying, keep looking for more things and keep learning. And I think that's the only way that we will evolve next to our cities, you know? <laughs> yes. Okay, so what is your favorite place making mantra? Ooh, place making mantra. Um, well, I don't know if it's, maybe it's, it's that, you know, that um, that you, you're you never done. <laughs> the yeah. place making you're never done. Yesterday we were asking cities, when are they ready to, to, to take steps to be more child friendly? And they were like, oh, you're never ready. <laughs> you just go and do it and then you try it out and then you keep looking how it goes. So I think both of them are, are very true for plate making. You're never ready and <laughs> and you never stop doing. So it's never done. It's always a, a process in evolution, but I think it brings it brings a lot of impact and it brings a lot of short term and long term impact. So it's worth just trying. Yeah, it's just so natural and it helps us grow as well. The, as the process, with, with the process, we grow along with the area and everything else. Everyone involved, involved in the process. Okay, so share your opinion about Pakistan and our place in Pakistan. Oh, um, well, I have not been to Pakistan, so I couldn't uh, tell a very uh, correct opinion, I would say. But from what I've seen from my friends and, um, and even like from you guys, uh, is that there is a lot of challenges but there's a lot of young people willing to solve that and i have this i have this feeling from i you you submitted these these pictures for the real play city challenge with children playing and in the public space and something that brings me a lot of insights is that maybe the infrastructure in our countries not only in pakistan but i could say the same in ecuador it's not the best but i don't think that it's a matter of changing the infrastructure in order to or a matter of only changing the infrastructure in order to have livable cities it's a matter of who is in the city <laughs> you know and i think that young people in pakistan is bringing that change is bringing that well, we're going to use what we have to, to bring spaces of change, to bring spaces to live together, to bring spaces of sharing. And I think also, maybe I'm wrong, but I have this feeling that the public space is being every time more important. Because I do feel that, I, I'm not sure if this is true for Pakistan, but for Ecuador, specifically on the... On the highlands that are a little bit colder it is about the family and it's about being at home <laughs> and the public space was never that important but now that the globalization and the, the young people have other ideas in mind i think we are very aware that to be creative to be productive you need to be together with others so we have put that importance on public space way more than before and I'm glad that this importance that we're putting in public space is not only for us, but for future generations. So I see that from your work, that you work with, a, you are young yourself, you're super young yourself, and you are dedicating all this time to have this interview, to talk with a lot of people, to do projects yourself, to the things that you're doing with schools and with children. So you're not only thinking like, oh, I would like my sidewalk to be nicer, you know, and, and my house to look prettier, you're thinking of how, are I, how am I going to meet all these people? How am I going to create all these spaces for people? 
and how am I going to do it for children as well? So they learn about it. So I think that, and I've seen that from my friends in Pakistan as well, and from the people that I've shared this public space with, <laughs> that, that you're doing everything to create these spaces and it goes beyond the infrastructure. It goes to, to what do you want? What are your ideals and how can we be together? Yes, thank you so much for your kind words. Okay, so lastly, um, what message would you like to give to global readers out there as many young professionals are joining in? So one message you would like to give them, the readers? Um, I would say that one message would be just be more aware of the spaces that you're in and what is it that you can do to change it for the good of everybody? Like, I don't know, it's, is it your sidewalk? Is it a park? Is it <laughs> so anything, anything that, that you could go out and just make it better for everyone, try it out for yourself and, and do it. Great. Thank you so much, Viviana, for this episode. Thank you for joining me. It was lovely talking to you. I've learned so much. And you have actually motivated me to go out and do many great things. And yes, I will do them. And we will collaborate as well, as soon as some ideas just kick in. So thank you so much for joining me today. Take care. Yes. Thank okay. you too. That's awesome. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.